I wonder how many of you um, would characterize yourself as a people pleaser. Anybody a people pleaser? No one's raising their hand. Just the people pleasers raise their hand. <laughs> it's got to make me feel better, so thank you for that. You know, it is kind of normal, I think, for us to want to have people like us and accept us. Um, it's so funny when I look back on um, growing up that certainly there was pressure. Pressure to conform, and you want, don't want to stand out. You want everybody to, uh, to like you and accept you. So when I was growing up, that meant really long hair for guys and really ugly bell-bottom pants and platform shoes. And if you're old enough, you even know what a Nehru jacket is um, and how anyone could ever wear those. Um, and, you know, those kinds of things are relatively harmless. But when your people-pleasing kind of gets to the point where you change your beliefs or change your values just to be accepted or liked, that's a problem. That's something where you're compromising a part of you. And some of you might wonder, and wonder why, in a, in a place filled with um, Rockies fans, that I would be a Dodger fan. Well, it's the same reason. I'm not going to change my values to fit in with the crowd. So there's actually a spiritual, a spiritual reason. And maybe that's a good example of how you can kind of twist the Bible to say whatever you want it to say. But as Jesus continued in his ministry, um, there were a lot of different reactions to what he did and what he said. And so I think it's helpful for us to look at his life so that we can gain some valuable insight into how we should respond to various people uh, and groups that we encounter. Because no matter how sheltered we are, we're always going to have someone that doesn't like what we're doing. We're going to have someone that just cheers us on, and no matter what we do, they're going to say, yeah, that's great, that's fine. And so we need to have discernment on how do you handle both negative and positive responses, people that just kind of, you know, throw you aside and people that just hang on every word. Well, as we turn to Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 3, we left off at the end of verse 6, so we're going to be picking up in Mark 3, 7, so if you have your Bibles or if you have your apps on your phone or whatever, please turn to Mark chapter 3. And in the first few verses there, starting in verse 7, what we see is that we're to be careful not to allow the demands of the crowd to control your decisions. Don't allow whatever group you're in, whoever the crowd is in your life, to influence you to make decisions according to what's popular, according to what they would say is the value. And so let's read, uh, I'm going to read for you starting in verse 7 of Mark chapter 3, and I'm going to read through uh, verse 12 to start off with this morning. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a large crowd followed from Galilee. And a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, Beyond the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon, the large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so the crowd wouldn't crush him. Since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! And he would strongly warn them not to make him known." As we look at Jesus' life, he didn't allow the, the crowd to affect his decisions. And in these first few verses of Mark chapter 3, we see the crush of the crowd, that, that it's become almost out of control. And so if you remember in uh, the first six verses of this chapter, it, verse 6 ended with the Pharisees plotting with the Herodians about how they might kill him. And so strategically, he thought, I need to move from the synagogue to a, maybe a more public place. And so he departed with his disciples to the sea, which was the Sea of Galilee. Today it's called the, the Sea of Tiberias. And the crowd still came. They found him. It seems like no matter where Jesus went, the crowds knew where he was. And in verse 8, it, it talks about where they came from, all these different places, Idumea is in the south, and Tyre and Sidon's in the north. Uh, beyond the Jordan is in the east. 
So they come from all over, all different regions, composed of both Jews and Gentiles. So they had different religious backgrounds even, but they came. And my guess is most of them came because they heard about his miracles. They heard about his healing. They heard about him casting out demons. And some of them probably came because they had legitimate needs. They either needed to be healed themselves or maybe they had friends or loved ones that they brought to him. Maybe there was struggles with demon possession and so they brought him to Jesus. But my guess is, like most crowds, there are some that are just coming because it's exciting. Isn't that true? You ever, you ever drive down the interstate and there's no reason for the traffic to slow down, but all of a sudden it almost goes to a crawl. Why? Because there's an accident and everybody slows down to look at the accident. And my guess is that was part of what was happening in Jesus' ministry. As the word got out, people were starting to come and try to figure out what's going on or they just wanted some excitement. They were bored and this was something that was uh, really unusual. Uh, probably there were some that were beginning to be believers and so they wanted to follow him and they wanted to respond out of legitimate reasons. All kinds of mixed motives in the crowd. And it talks about in verses 11 and 12 how he interacted with those that had unclean spirits. We would call those demons. Verse 11 says, Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. Well, what would happen uh, in this situation was that there was something about these unclean spirits that they recognized immediately who Jesus was. Living in that spiritual realm, they had more insight than the people and probably even than the disciples. And I think it's interesting that it says the ones that had these unclean spirits, they fell down before him. They recognized his power and they even testified of that. But Jesus didn't want that. And we saw this earlier in the Gospel of Mark that he rebuked the unclean spirits and he forbid them to tell about him. He didn't want publicity coming from demons. He didn't want people's source of information about him to come from unclean spirits. And as I read through this and I was pondering what would be a, a principle for today, well, w one thought that came to my mind is that popularity in crowds are not always a benefit to ministry. You see, because we don't always think that way. We think numbers are the most important thing. And that if we have more numbers, that means we're, we're doing a better job. And I have to admit, it is exciting to have numbers. It's wonderful to have new people coming and have more people that are excited about worship and hearing God's word preached. But sometimes crowds, big crowds, can be a problem even among themselves. Um, they're coming for all kinds of reasons. Some were selfish. Uh, some of them were entertainment I remember when I was in Dallas, and I'd never lived in the Bible Belt before, I was going to seminary in Dallas, and there were these giant singles groups where there would be 200 people in these singles groups. And I thought, this is amazing that they have this many single adults coming to uh, a church event. Little did I know that that wasn't why a lot of them were coming. They were coming because it was a pickup place. And some of them had no intention of learning the Bible. It was just to meet people and uh, not always with the best intent. And so I, I kind of learned, I went to, a, I remember I went to a, a retreat our singles group had, and um, in, in Texas at the time, they didn't have open container laws, you, you know what I mean? So you'd see people driving down the street with their elbow out of the car with a, with a beer in their hand as they were driving. And so I, I went, we went to this lake, uh, I think it was somewhere near Austin, and one of the guys, I just happened to, be in his his vehicle and he was towing a big boat behind him because we were going to the lake and I don't know if he had a six pack or a 12 pack under his seat but he finished it before we got to the lake and I just thought oh man we're not in Kansas anymore are we <laughs> don't know it was really different and so I, I started to learn you know especially in the Bible Belt not everybody that goes to church goes for the right reason and I'm sure Jesus and his disciples were beginning to learn the crowds aren't always a positive sign, that they're not always there to grow spiritually and follow and serve God, though some were, and there's reason to rejoice over that. 
So I guess the point is, let's not evaluate ministry success just by the numbers. Numbers can be a blessing. Numbers can be a wonderful sign of God at work, but not always. It's tempting when you get a big crowd to try to please the crowds instead of following God's purposes, to teach the word and to make disciples. And unfortunately, there are churches today that have fallen into that trap. Their desire is to have a seeker church so they can get a big crowd. And, and I'm sure the leadership, their, their intent is good, that they want to reach more people for Christ. But I think what happens is the more that people come, they start thinking, well, what do we do to keep them? You know, because you can only give out so many free hamburgers. And after a while, you, you got to think, well, I, maybe I need to do something else. And you can get distracted from the ministry that you're called to. That popularity can distort or even obscure the message. So what about yourself? How do you define success? In your business, in your group of friends, uh, in your social life, in your church? Uh, is it the size or is it finances or is it recognition? We have to pray for wisdom, for guidance from God, that we would truly be following him and our desire is to be significant in the kingdom of God, not just to have worldly success. And then secondly, um, we need to find people who share our values that we can train them to serve in God's kingdom. So find people who share your values that you can train to serve in God's kingdom. And we see this in Jesus' calling of the 12 in verses 13 to 19. It says, Jesus went up to the mountain. Notice he was at the sea. Now he's changing location in the mountain. And he summoned those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the 12. To Simon he gave the name Peter. And to James, the sons of Zebedee, and to his brother John, he gave the name Peter. Boandrus, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So he's going from a very public scene to a little more private one, and he, and he calls to him uh, some of his closer followers, and he summoned those, or in some translation it says, that he called those that he wanted. And I don't know if you've noticed in Scripture, but the word calling is used in a, a, a few different ways. In the New Testament, there's the call to salvation, where the Gospels preach and people are called to come and accept the Lord, to trust in him, be part of his family. There's also a, a call to discipleship, which is following after Jesus, being committed to him and learning his ways and teaching others. And then there's also a calling to service, and that's what's happening here. You notice that he calls them and he gives them a job, and for the first time in the Gospel of Mark, he, he changes his designation. He calls them apostles. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but apostles are different than disciples. I mean, we think of the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles, and so, you know, we sometimes maybe blur that, that description or that title, but they really mean different things. Uh, a disciple's a student, while an apostle is one sent with a mission. These were apprentices. These were those who were trained and sent out for a task or for a ministry. And here it says that he gave them authority to drive out demons, and he sent them out to preach. So they had a specific task that Christ had called them to do. They weren't just students. They weren't just learners. And I think the number 12 is interesting. As I, I studied this, one of the things some of the commentators said was that 12 is not necessarily a common used number in the Bible. Seven is, three is, 12 isn't as much, and so they thought that maybe this was a, a strong reminder of the 12 tribes of Israel. You have 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, and you have 12 apostles in the New Testament. 
So maybe a principle here that we can glean from this is that a long-lasting ministry requires training and equipping others to serve and continue the work. You know, one of the things that I've, I've found just from observing is that churches that have big crowds, that have a great following for a senior pastor, or the main preaching pastor that's real dynamic, the big question is what happens when he leaves? And maybe you've, you've known that, maybe you've seen that, where you have a church where there's a big following, a big crowd because of the, uh, the, just the, the giftedness of the leadership. And then when that pastor leaves, it shrinks down. Well, I, I think the secret to a long-lasting ministry is, first of all, don't make it rest all on one person. No matter how gifted they are, no matter how loved they are, make sure everybody's involved. And that as many as you can, you train them and equip them to, to serve and to continue the work. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Someone once said, the ministers in the church isn't the person standing up front that does the sermon the saints are the ones that are to do the ministry. In other words, the, the Christians, those set apart by God. All of us have a ministry. And that the, the role of leaders, besides whatever their designation might be, whether they're youth workers or choir directors or Sunday school teachers, but part of our responsibility also is to equip or train other people so that they can do their ministry, so that they can do the work that God has called them to do. And that's one thing that I found as a, as a leader, the, the one way that ministry continues on is people that are gifted, if they don't just focus on their own ministry, but they find someone else that they can show how to do it, that they can train them, that they can watch them, that they can give them feedback, that they can kind of bring them along or, or mentor and that was all, that's always been my dream in the church is that whether you're a Sunday school teacher or whether you're a small group leader or men's ministry or women's ministry, that somewhere along the line you find somebody that you can kind of build into. Because eventually something's going to happen to you and then there's going to be a big hole. And, and it is, it's helpful and it's exciting to see people blossom as they use their gifts and as they get trained and they gain confidence in serving the Lord in that way. In 2 Timothy 2.2, um, 2, Paul says to Timothy, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Same idea here. Reproduction, multiplication. And that's one of the ways you can define a mature disciple is that that person him or her is able to reproduce themselves. They're able to multiply themselves by training other people. So I guess one important question for all of us is, what's the next step in your spiritual growth and development? Maybe you're a seeker and you haven't quite made that, that step yet of trusting in Jesus Christ. That would be the first thing, to join God's family by personally putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And for some of you, maybe you've done that. Probably most of us have. But then the next step would be to grow as a disciple or a student of Jesus through personal time in the Word and prayer and being in a, a small group where you can be accountable to, to a small group of people or another person, maybe a, just a prayer partner that you can meet with to, to mutually encourage each other. Um, a, a third step would be discovering and using your spiritual gift in a ministry. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for uh, our leadership team is to be able to identify and help people identify where do they plug in? Where's their niche? How can they use what God has given them to serve? And you know, it's, uh, it's delightful when that happens. And you begin to see people get excited about how God has gifted them, and they, and they start using that. Uh, another would be, a, a further step might be getting to the point where you're able to mentor or disciple someone else. 
Um, and that would certainly be a, a sign of maturity. A, a third response that we see from Jesus as he encounters various groups is to watch out for those who oppose the work that God has called you to. And, and starting in verse 20, we see opposition from, surprisingly enough, Jesus' family, as well as from the scribes and the religious leaders. Um, starting in verse 20, it says, Jesus entered a house, and the crowd gathered again, so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him, because they said, he's out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they are saying he has an unclean spirit. So in these verses, we, we kind of move from those that are attracted to Jesus, and we're certainly moving away from those that he's called to be apostles to those that oppose him that stand against him. And because of Jesus' popularity and his schedule, his family tried to intervene. And they went beyond the point of intervening. They even accused him of being crazy. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. To me, that was one of the things that frustrated me so much as I became a young adult was when my mom would call and she'd say, uh, you know, and I'm 26 or something at this point. Are you warm enough? Are you getting enough to eat? You, you ever get that, you know? And that's relatively harmless. She cared about me, and so I'm like, yeah, Mom, I'm fine, you know? Didn't really like it, but it wasn't like it was a big, serious problem. But in this situation, it went beyond, Jesus, we're worried about you because you don't even have time to eat. No, it was, you're crazy. You're so busy. This has gotten so out of hand. You're not in control of yourself anymore. We're going to go have an intervention or something. That they were opposing his ministry. It went from beyond uh, parental concern or family concern to we're going to stop this because he doesn't know what he's doing. It's gotten so out of control. And you know, sadly enough, that sometimes happens in homes where, and it might even happen in a, Christian home or a church going home or someone gets on fire for the Lord and is excited about it and they want to tell their friends and maybe they even decide, you know what, I'm going to quit my job and go to seminary and I feel like God's calling me to be a pastor and their family's like, forget it, that's crazy, you're, you're just overboard, you're, you're a fanatic now. And you know, sometimes it's good, I think, to get counsel, to have people share with uh, you their concerns. But also there's a time when you have to make a firm decision and say, you know what, even if this is something my parents don't like or something that uh, my, my friends don't agree with or they don't understand, I know this is what God wants me to do. And so that we have to take a, a stand. And then even more seriously, the, the scribes, and it says they were from Jerusalem, so they were the bigwigs. They weren't just from, you know... Um, kind of backwards Galilee. They were from Judea, from the center where everything was going on. They were the big shots in the religious world. And they accused him of being empowered by Satan. They said that he does these things. He, he casts out these unclean spirits by the power that he has from the one who is in charge of those spirits, speaking most likely of Satan. And as we look at this, I think what we see is that they can't deny the miracles. They know what they've seen. They've seen these impossible things happening. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> 
And so they can't, de they can't deny the miracles, so what do they do? They say, sure, those are happening, but you know why they're happening? They're happening because he has power that's been given to him from Satan. They don't attack the miracles themselves. They attack the source of his power to try to discredit him and what he has done. And so he, he shares a, a parable to show the error of their accusation. And in this parable, he, he's talking about kingdoms. He says, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot sta stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is uh, divided, he cannot stand, but is finished. He said, this doesn't even make sense. How can I have the power of Satan or the power that comes from the devil to cast out demons when that's actually hurting Satan's cause? But instead, he says, as he continues with this parable, he says, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. What's he saying? He's saying, I have power over Satan. I have power to bind the strong man. I have power to plunder his house. And so he's again pointing to his authority and who he is. But then he goes on, and in this section I know there's a lot of Bible students and, and Christians that are somewhat troubled or have questions about what he's talking about in verses 28 to 30. But he's revealing the seriousness of their accusation against the work of the Holy Spirit through him. Look at verse 28. It says, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. And then especially look at 30, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. What he's saying here is that um, it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit confirming who Jesus is that a person will believe in him and be saved. So these that are attributing what he was doing to the power of Satan were cutting off the Spirit's work in their life to bring them to salvation. Uh, his accusers are blaspheming the Holy Spirit in that way. And, and they're not allowing themselves to be convicted and drawn to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so, of course, they, they can't be saved. And, and so the principle is something that we need to understand about what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit then, back in Jesus' day, and now? And there's a lot of different views as you read the uh, biblical scholars. And one view is that it was only something that could happen then. That as bad as it was to oppose Jesus' ministry or speak against him, it was certainly forgivable. But to attribute the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' earthly ministry to Satan was unforgivable. And I stress earthly ministry. When Jesus was present on this earth, to say that everything he did was in the power of Satan was an unforgivable sin. And, and the reason is because again, it was the confirmation of the Holy Spirit that would draw people or bring people um, to Jesus Christ. And so if that was not happening, they couldn't come to him. And so in that sense, it was unforgivable that if they can't come to salvation, if they don't believe in him, then that's something that isn't going to be able to get them out of hell and into heaven if they never believe. And so that kind of leads to how can it occur today. And one thing I, I think we need to understand is that if it's something that it can occur today, it's not what most people think it is. I mean, some people think, well, the unforgivable sin is divorce or drunkenness or gambling or something. It's, it's none of those things. Um, my belief is that if it was to occur today, it would be continuing to resist and reject the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin. Of his proving who Jesus is, it's going to ultimately result in dying in unbelief. Because all, all sins are forgivable. But the only sin that's not forgivable is 
refusing to believe in Jesus Christ because he's the source of forgiveness. And if we don't believe in him, then we've cut off that way to be saved. So one author I read, and I agree with this statement, said it's not a sin a believer can do to lose their salvation. It's the sin of an unbeliever that keeps them from being saved. Does that make sense? That, that, that's not something that as a believer we need to worry about. Oh no, you know, I was mad at God and I said something and so now I can't ever be forgiven or I've done something and it was so bad I can't ever be forgiven. Well, that's not true. God will forgive any sin, but the one that he can't forgive is the one that's keeping you from him, from trusting in him and, and believing in him. And on the other hand, we don't know that there is no way to know that until a person has died in their unbelieving state. You can't say someone to someone that maybe you have a, a relative or somebody that you know that just, no, I don't believe in any of that stuff. That stuff's a bunch of garbage. You know, I don't believe that Jesus, you know, even existed, much less died on the cross and rose from the dead. You can't say that person's committed the un, unforgivable sin, that that person has no chance of being reconciled to God. Because we don't know what God will do in their life. Maybe even on their deathbed, we don't know. But we do know that if a person never comes to faith in Jesus Christ, that ends up being the unforgivable sin because they're not forgiven. They died in an unsaved condition. So getting back to kind of dealing with different groups of people, this time groups that would oppose you or your ministry or the ministry that God has called you to, the application thought here is realize there will always be those who oppose the life and work God has called you to. Remain strong and unyielding. There will be people that don't understand. There will be people that think you're a fanatic. There will be people that says you're wasting your time or, or you're making stupid decisions that don't make sense. Be firm in your belief and in your trust in what God's doing in your life. And then the last part is know who your spiritual family is. This one's kind of sad in a way. Um, this kind of is a follow-up of when uh, Jesus' uh, family was there and were thinking he's crazy. In verse 31 it says, His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, Look, your mother and your brother, your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. His family came for him. They were uh, trying to keep him from doing the work that God the Father had called him to. They were opposing what he was doing, saying he's crazy, and they're coming to get him. They said, you know, let him know we're here. Because they thought somehow that he would stop then. And he's informed about that, and rather than uh, doing what maybe some in that culture would say he should have done, listen to his family, he questions, and he redefine, redefines what family means. This would have seemed so outrageous at the time. One's family was the basis of their social life, their economic life, it was their identity. But Jesus said there's a different identity. There's a different calling that I have. That in God's kingdom, our identity is based upon our relationship to him and a commitment to doing his will. So in application, we can take comfort in knowing that no matter how our earthly family treats us, God has given us a spiritual forever family. You know, there's a lot of cultures and a lot of countries where people who declare their faith in Jesus Christ are rejected and abandoned and even persecuted by their family. And I'm sure that's hard. I, I was blessed to have a family that followed the Lord and to ha have a mom that encouraged me in the ministry calling that I felt like God had put in my life. But there are some that don't. Their family rejects them, turns their back on them. I've even heard of, of some uh, situations where the family will have a funeral after their son or daughter comes to know Christ, and usually it's because of baptism, because it's very public, and they disown him. They say, you're no longer a child of mine. You're dead to me. 
And you know, that can cause a lot of, of hurt, a lot of questioning. And that was something that Peter, later on in Mark 10, 29, and 30, he asked Jesus about. What about us who have left our families, left our, our profession? And it says in verse 29 of Matthew 10, or Mark 10, Truly I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. Now and in the age to come. There's something eternal about being part of God's family. That, you know, there might be times in your life where the person sitting next to you might not get along with and you might not want them in your family. But if you're Christians, you're forever part of the same family. And that no matter where you go and no matter what's going on in your life, you can count on the fact that you have brothers and sisters in Christ if you know the Lord. So as we close, uh, I have a question. And that is, where are you in this story? Jesus had a lot of different interactions in this chapter. Um, have you come along with the crowd? Maybe looking to be entertained or to have some need met? Well, the assurance is there's much more than that. That might be a beginning point. That might be an entry point to come because someone told you that, man, you need to come to church. You need to hear God's word. Or are you like Jesus' family, uh, making sure your family, your friends, don't get too fanatical about this Jesus stuff? Well, if that's the case, maybe you need to examine your own faith. If it isn't worth dying for, if it isn't worth everything, maybe you don't have the real thing. Or perhaps you're so against the whole thing, even though the Holy Spirit's moving in your heart, you refuse to believe it and are ready to completely close the door. As long as you're alive, you're not a lost cause. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're discouraged and hurt because your family and your former friends have turned their back on you because of your faith in Jesus. Take heart. You have a spiritual family that loves you, that cares about you, that includes you, and you're part of God's forever family. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I know that uh, in a group this size, there are probably a number of, of different responses to you. And Lord, my most heartfelt prayer is that you would draw people to your son. That wherever we are, uh, if it's at a point of unbelief or doubt or questioning, Lord, that you would soften our heart to you and to respond to your Holy Spirit. Or if we're just a new believer and we're just kind of barely learning, Lord, I pray that you'd encourage us. Help us to find a, a place where we can grow and that we can have uh, spiritual friends, Lord. Or, or maybe awaken those that have kind of gotten drowsy in their Christian life, that they would really ask you, where can I serve? Where can I be a part? How can I... Um, further your kingdom in the gifts that you've given me. Or, or maybe there's some that are discouraged today because they don't have a lot of encouragement. They don't have a, a, a physical, biological family that joins them in their faith journey. Lord, I pray that you'd bring alongside them the spiritual family that you intend to nurture them and help them grow. Thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. Thank you for calling us into your family and for allowing us to be part of your kingdom work. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we all stand together and sing hymn number 446. I will serve thee.
Cueiro, please close us.